How's it sound? A little bit. There we go. So, uh, so like as I described, I was I was going to be a panelist, kind of just doing the computer security part. That's uh, the the computer forensics. Um, that's my specialty, uh, and so uh, I don't know much about you know basic forensics. I do have a single slide on it, and uh, it's completely copied from a website. So I will uh, I will present that. How many here are, are really interested in the forensics side, the, the the basic forensics? Okay. Good, not a majority, uh, a couple of you. So you'll really enjoy my one slide on forensics. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so I will talk more about the you know, cyber forensics. That's my uh, specialty. And um, uh, we got a, a couple videos, and we'll go kind of jump in here. So, um, so what I do right now, um, I'm a VP at a uh, startup, uh, Drawbridge Networks. Um, Tom Cross is our CTO. He started off the, the EFF track this morning. So uh, um, um, been hacking since the late 80s. Uh, been coming here to DragonCon since the early 90s. And uh, what, what my relevant uh, technical skills is around, I'm an expert witness in, in a number of cases um, and, um, and, and it's on, on, the, on cyber forensics. I've done both uh, corporate uh, expert witness and, um, and then also for PD. And um, there's, a, there's a great organization called uh, HTCIA, it's High Technology Crime Investigation Association. And I was a good, fun, a good standing member of that uh, until I took a job uh, working for uh, the defense. And uh, that's actually against their bylaws, so I'm, I'm, I'm a bad guy now. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm a, I guess, a gray hat forensics person. Um, uh, but that, uh, personally, I feel like, you know, um, I, I do think child porn is bad, but it's also the witch hunt of today. And so, um, you know, not everybody uh, that, that has that stuff on their, web, on their computer, you know, knowingly downloaded it. And, and so there is, I think, a, a good reason for um, being able to make sure that the people go jail for that are the ones that are, are doing the bad stuff. So, um, all right, yeah, and I'm a tech alum. So what are we going to do? Uh, like I said, I've got my one slide on cyber forensics. Um, and throughout this, definitely raise your hands and stop, stop me. Um, I, I want to make this interact. You, you came to see a panel and a ask questions and answer. Uh, don't ask me about regular forensics. I, I, my CSI knowledge is, is pretty up there. I've got friends that do it, but then, yeah, couldn't get them, get them to come down. Uh, so yeah, so for the cyber forensics side, we're going to you know, look at a couple video clips and you know make fun of them. Um, I'm going to teach you about like how forensics is has been done classically, and then uh, and and is still done in, in like uh, uh, in in any type of an, uh, police investigations, um, and then how uh, forensics is is moving toward you know more of a real time model, especially in the corporate area. Um, I've got a slide, and I can talk uh, some about Apple and, and FBI, since that is a uh, you know um, is particularly about you know uh, how to get data off of mobile. I've got mobile stuff in here, uh, but if uh, if there's a lot of interest, I can I can talk about that. There's a full session on that uh, later on in the EFF track that will probably uh, touch your fancy a little bit more if you're very interested in that. Um, and then we'll talk about some uh, anti-forensics tools and privacy tools so that uh, you, you get both sides of the discussion here because I'm a bad guy. Um, all right, so here's my one slide on, on uh, basic forensics. Uh, so 10 myths uh, spread by TV. Uh, and um, I like this one is that forensics only work on murders, and that's not really the case, right? You know, that they have uh, uh, a lot of different... Um, uh, things that get pulled into their lab uh, that uh, and there, there really isn't that many people that get murdered uh, they're they're very busy uh, people and um, and and it's it is it's not all you know gruesome uh, SVU type stuff um, another myth the, the, you know it's a well-paid position uh, you know you're, you're up in the 200 thousands and and driving you know you got cool eyeglasses uh, and uh, or sunglasses um, and and that's also not the case. Is that uh, um, you know, basically the national average uh, for um, somebody in the in the forensic field is around forty five thousand. Uh, uh, and so uh, another myth is they interrogate subjects uh, and 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 are part of the investigation. Uh, 
Typically, no. And in most cases, uh, uh, most forensics uh, folks are going to be working in a lab, and they get stuff sent to them, and they process it in a very uh, programmatic fashion so that they can, uh, so that it's defensible in court. Um, and, and then they send it back. Uh, that's pretty much uh, how it works. Um, DNA evidence is uh, is is not the end all be all, right? And and uh, there's you know the CSI effect. And if you've ever uh, if you work in the legal field, is that uh, you know in jury cases, people think that CSI is the way things happen. And so uh, you know, uh, prosecution will a lot of times try to leverage that to say this is definitive um, and uh, all of it and all of the um, going back and, and, and reanalyzing you know cases has been closed by DNA uh, that there's a lot of exonerations out there um, and so yeah uh, DNA evidence isn't isn't all that it's cracked up to be um, I like this one tester done in a matter of hours right you know call down to the lab and they've got, they got their little spinny thing and, and it's done and again not the case is that that it's uh, there's usually a backlog and um, and nothing in the legal system works fast um, and so you, you're looking at weeks months uh, according on uh, which which lab is doing it um, and that forensic analysts never make mistakes. Is that you know CSI? They've got their they've got their uh, methods, and and uh, and that's that's not the case. Uh, every forensics examiner strives to do the best, I'm sure. Uh, but that uh, you know we're all humans. We all make mistakes. Technology gets better sometimes, and so uh, you know our methods change over time. Um, and that criminals always make mistakes. That there's some type of like hair somewhere in that crime scene that's going to you know prove it, and. Uh, uh, they get all the evidence in, and, and they can send back and say non-conclusive. They have no additional uh, evidence to provide to the prosecution. Um, forensic labs are high-tech, and all the like. Uh, 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 you know, they definitely go overboard with like the, the the graphical GUIs that you know don't exist, but that you know um, that they have all these really specialized equipment, um, and uh, and and that again is not, is not really the case. Is that uh, you know, centrifuges to be able to do DNA breakdowns, uh, and it looks a lot more like your high school chemical lab than you would, you know, see it in any type of TV or show. Um, and uh, yeah, cr crimes are solved quickly. This kind of goes back to that: is that uh, you know that this is a a very timely uh, thing, and and um, I like this the last one. That you have to have a one-line catch you know, to uh, catchphrase to be able to, uh, to to solve the case. Yep. Theme songs, yep, uh, and uh, so I, I hope they do. <laughs> I would love to meet some forensics folks that were like, hold on, and they push play and they walk into the room. That would be great. Uh, uh, so, um, and there's the the website I stole that from. Uh, pretty much word for word. All right, so let's let's I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up some of the you know, for the really fake stuff um, and. Uh, most of this I grabbed. I tried to stick to uh, you know forensics analysis that, that you know catching hackers or, or ca you know finding the hacker as opposed to really bad hacking scenes, which I love those too. Because uh, and so I've got you know, a couple that might not be exactly forensics, but they're just damn funny. And that's the first one we'll start off with. Uh, and uh, so I'll play it first, and then uh, I'll tell you if 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 everyone doesn't understand why it's so stupid, then I will. Uh, uh, we got. Oh, we lost sound. GUI interface using Visual Basic. Yeah. See if I can track an IP address. All right. So, where's my controls? Do you see it up there? Oh, that's my timer. Let me see if I can go back a slide. Four, four. There we go. For weeks I've been investigating the cabbie killer murders with a certain morbid fascination. This is in real time. I'll create a GUI interface using Visual Basic. See if I can track an IP address. That's great. Uh, she's going to create a GUI interface in Visual Basic to track an IP. Uh, that's one of the best lines out there and uh, I had to share that with you. Um, tracking IP has nothing to do with a GUI interface and uh, I, 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 uh, if somebody told me that they were a programmer and still used Visual Basic, I would, you know, cry. Uh, and so, 
Yeah, so yes, uh, yeah, so uh, so that was a good one. Um, all right, this uh, this next one. Yeah, no, no, that's just the regular CSI. So, so, so she brings up uh, CSI Cyber. Um, who here has seen episode of C CSI Cyber? All right. Yeah, it's 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 what's what's confusing and hard about that is they throw out lots of real stuff, but they just get a lot of it wrong a little bit. And of course, there's always the, the over visualizations and the speed of, of which they do things is is, is off. Um, but also, you know, they're, they're, uh, they throw enough, like I said, they throw enough real stuff where I'm like, okay, 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 no, <laughs> no. And then, and that, that generally happens. Uh, one of my pet peeves is, is uh, from, you know, this is just kind of a general computer thing. And they've been doing it in the, in, the, uh, in, in movies and films for like 20 years. Is this okay? Now let's get a good look at you. Hold it. Run that back. Wait a minute. Go right. There, freeze that. Full screen. Okay, freeze that. Tighten up on that way. Vector in on that guy by the back of you. Zoom in right here on the spot. With the right equipment, the image could be enlarged and sharpened. What's that? Is it enhancement program? Can you clear that up any? I don't know. Let's enhance it. Enhance section A6. I enhance the detail and... I think there's enough to enhance release it to my screen. It has the reflection in your eye. Let's run this through video enhancement. Victor, can you enhance this? Hang on. I've been working on this reflection. There's someone's reflection. The reflection. There's a reflection of the man's face. The reflection. There's a reflection. Zoom in on the mirror. You can see your reflection. Can you enhance the image from here? Can you enhance it right here? Can you enhance it? Can you enhance it? Can we enhance this? Can you enhance it? Enhance it. Enhance it. Zoom in on the door. Times tap. Zoom. Move in. Wait, stop. Stop. Pause it. Rotate a 75 degrees around the vertical place. Stop. Go back to the part about the door again. Got an image enhancer that can bitmap? We can use the produce send method to see into the windows. This software is state of the art. The eigenvalue is off. With the right combination of algorithms. He's taken elimination algorithms to the next level, and I can use them to enhance this photograph. Lock on and enlarge the z-axis. Enhance. 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 Freeze and enhance. Enhance. Uh. So, so yes, that was a, a great old montage. I, when I saw that, I was like, yeah, this, that was just great. I mean, from, from 20 years of cinema, you know, that magical button that enhances photos. Uh, so uh, to, to put it into technological terms so that, you know, you actually learn something from tonight. If you don't already know, that, that basically pixels are pixels. And, um, uh, and, and that as you, uh, you know, same thing with traditional film, the 35 millimeter was just bigger. It could hold more you know, chemicals and light than a 110. You know, uh, uh, and so same thing with digital cameras. As you, you shoot a five megapixel, uh, it's going to be more than a, you know, have more data in it than a two megapixel. Um, and so, uh, you know, it gets to a point where, you know, if you're zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, uh, there's only so much you can do with the information. Um, and so and that's always been the case. Now, there is some caveats, is that uh, there is some interesting stuff out there uh, that I found is basically for motion picture, if they're going through a, a, a video surveillance, uh, that um, c uh, basically reducing the noise of the, uh, you know, a person moving across the screen, that there is some pretty neat enhancement technology of basically, you know, kind of cleaning that up and, and, and getting information from several different pictures and putting them together. Um, and then I'm, I've just dropped the name of the camera, but there's, there's this camera type that is out there now um, that allows you to take a picture and then you can focus afterwards. What's it called? Lytra. Lytra. Um, and so, uh, so that, it, that's real. Um, and, and, uh, and enhancing video is real, but you're not nothing like what you see in, in the films. So. Um, all right, so uh, one more video here, and we'll go into some more content. Uh, this one is great because, uh, and I broke it. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> Indeed. I've been hacked. <laughs> oh, sorry.
I'll try to disconnect it. Do -do -do. And reconnect. I got a pretty sound. It has detected my source. Oh, that's my desktop. Alright, so escape out of this. Okay. Uh, so. Usually once it works, it works for the whole presentation. Aha, look at there. Okay, so one more video. Uh, this got some great, you know, just wrongness about technology and, and, and catching the hacker. Um, and I'll, di I'll uh, dissect this after we watch. Trying to decode it, but it could take days. Still no sign of Feigenbaum trying to attack Augie's site. No. And Zal Feigenbaum is easily as good a hacker as Augie. Yeah, he's probably trying to decode the back door, too. You know what? What? If he's not trying to hack Augie, I mean, what if he's trying to find him? IRC, Internet Relay Chat. It's how hackers talk when they don't want to be overheard. Kind of true. It's a pretty primitive chat program. Think of it like shipping channels in the ocean. You can't see them until a boat cuts through the water, leaving a wake. If two boats meet in the middle of the ocean to swap a load of illegal drugs, you have to catch them in real time. Otherwise, there's no evidence of the meeting left behind. No names, no account. Not true. There's no records of exchange. Well, how do they see each other? Online names. Okay, so what? We got the fist, and, and what's Augie's? Who's Meister? Okay, I'll set up an alarm to alert us if either name enters an IRC channel. And can we see what they're saying? In lead speak. Luckily, I speak lead. That's so hot. Lead speak. Here, show of hands, who can speak lead speak? Anybody? Some 3133 plus? Yeah, okay, good. Alright, Feigen Mom's online. Okay, I'll get done. What are they saying? Yeah. Our AV guy is back, so uh, the, the, project the projector uh, basically just loses uh, wait, source detect. There we go. Yeah. yeah I'm trying. I enhanced it. I did. Enhanced. Okay, got a surprise for you. Funny. Got one for you, too. You got a trace? Yeah, but they're probably bouncing off 100 IPs. I mean, they'll be offline before we... I love technology. All right, so we got pre pretty much through that. Uh, so uh, the idea here is, is uh, yeah, uh, IRC. IRC is one of those ancient uh, protocols that existed before uh, the web on the Internet, and uh, it's, it is a, um, um, still used today. Uh, a lot of people will hit a website first to do then IRC chat. But uh, it's, it's basically people, somebody stands up an IRC server, and then you have a client, and the client connects to the IRC server, and you can chat. It, there's no magic to it. Um, they basically uh, uh, ask for the logs and whether or not you know your shipping channel has doesn't have a uh, any any evidence. Uh, is that uh, you know that, that it's up to the server administrator uh, whether or not they keep logs. And also, if there's any network uh, traffic in between it, um, you know that can be. Uh, um, uh, to, to get uh, no man in the middle to, to steal that data. Um, but yes, IRC does exist. Um, and uh, um, But yeah, the, the description of the shipping panels is just hor horrendous. So. Um, all right, so I'm done with some videos, um, and I'll move on to old school forensics again. Stop me at any time if you have a question. So basically, the, the way that it's done in forensics, and I, I, I literally, you know, I think that my first you know copying uh, you know doing this process uh, was in the mid 90s uh, and so this is a tried and true approach It's basically that there's something wrong on a, on a machine um, or um, that uh, you know and so if you're going to do research on it like it's got malware and you want to learn what the malware did or you're in a legal situation and your computer's been uh, possessed by the government um, and uh, is being evaluated for evidence uh, 
Um, and so when they send this to the cyber forensics lab, um, which at last count, uh, Atlanta PD had one FTE uh, doing this, um, is that um, you, get the, you get the device and you're going to make a copy of it. And you basically take the, hard, the raw hard drive, take it out of the computer, you plug it into this device that's called a write blocker. And it, what that does is it's a hardware device that says um, you are not going to be able to modify the hard drive. There's no physical way to, to modify the data on the hard drive. That way you have uh, what's called a chain of evidence. And again, if you're in, if from, in, from the legal field, that's very important, especially when it comes to digital uh, 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 evidence, is that you have to prove that chain of cu uh, custody. So as soon as you make that you know, bit by bit copy of that hard drive, you can then put the hard drive back in the evidence uh, bag and sign it off and s send it back to storage. And then you can do all of your um, analysis offline. Uh, question. Well, you have a cube. Uh, they're, they're recording the audio. So uh, do we know where the cube is? She's texting. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, hold on. Let's get this so that uh, your question can be s preserved forever. Nope. It's not on. Maybe. Good thing I was an instructor, so I've got this down. In the world of cheap SSDs, um, that there is a lot of this that, uh, that SSDs kind of change the way that we do things. Um, the um, there isn't uh, so the write blocker, you know, write blockers for SSD. I mean, because that's part of the. Uh, um, SATA protocol, so it's not a. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's SSD or not for the right, right blocker, uh, but um, that uh, you know in, in that in that instance you're you're still you know doing that bit for bit, bit copy. There are certain providers of of SSDs that provide um, hardware level um, access to things like secure wipe and and um, and doing bit for bit copies. That then you just you're, you're tapping into the firmware on the on the drive to do that and to enable uh, that and so uh, so yeah there's a, there's a lot of these things that kind of you know get skewed with the newer technology SSDs being one of them. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah, I mean it. I can go. We can talk in depth more about it. Uh, um, uh, so uh, so yeah. So you mount the copy, uh, mount that drive for analysis. You look through it. There's all sorts of software out there that can help you break into things if they you know if things have been encrypted or secured or hidden, um, and the, fr the the forensics analysis job is to go find the evidence, and so they usually have an idea you know they they have a target to find if it's a child porn case they're looking for you know, you know pictures and and, uh, and videos, and then they try to uh, create a timeline that shows. Uh, when this was downloaded and accessed and shared, uh, and so they can provide that timeline uh, back to um, back to the prosecution. And so the, the software that kind of automates a lot of that, and and as you go through and you set things up, it uses the f you know file modification, file time date stamps, which I'll talk about again in the anti forensics, um, is and and to build that timeline, and then you you know produce a report and says here's the evidence. He had the child porn or he, you know, uh, and and there's, there's no evidence of malware because that's there's a common defense of how that child porn got on there. It must have been a virus, um, and uh, it, it's it's normally not. <laughs> uh, there's not a lot of viruses out there that just spread child porn. Um, uh, there is vindictive second parties, um, and that's where I've I've helped on 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 the defense side. Is that you know, like I said, there are there are times where um, they're not guilty. Uh, so some of the tools I got listed there, if you're interested, um, in case is one of those that's just uh, kind of been standard for you know professionals. Uh, it costs money, is that's why I say professionals. Um, and then uh, some of the others I've got listed here. Uh, I think most of the others are, are going to be open source, um, and you can get all the tools on what's called uh, a live CD. And if you're unfamiliar with that term, live CDs are something you, you download and you're going to burn onto a CD, and then you can insert that CD into a computer. 
and boot up that OS, and you don't have to know anything about you know installing Linux on your, your machine. You you keep your Windows 10 with all your games on it, but then when you go do forensics, you, you use the live CD, and uh, and 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 it's it's much much easier. And we got a question up front. Kali, yes. I was putting this on there, and, and, and uh, I kept thinking of Nopix. And I was like, no, no, that's not right. Uh, uh, so Kali, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, you can just tell I'm old. That's, that's where it comes down to the back. Uh, is that, that that's, I, I, I think I might still write that on the CD when I burn a Kali uh, image. Um, but I, I, I use live CDs because the amount of tools that are on those CDs is just, to me, is, is ridiculous to sit there and, and install all of those on, on a particular machine and have that as a forensic. I don't do this as my day job, so. Sorry? Yeah, Philoplopics is it, yeah. You, and it's getting, I mean, USB, you can run live CDs off of USB keys as well. Um, there's tools out there where you don't even have to reboot. You can run the live CD in a virtual machine. Um, not recommended for doing uh, analysis work. All right, so uh, so that's that's how things have been done, and I've been uh, working for several companies that have changed the, the 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 story on how to do that. This is more applicable in a, in a corporate space, and so there is lots of um, you know um, uh, forensic uh, for forensic analysis that gets done on the corporate level, um, and uh, um, and so if you're if you're going to take an HR action on against somebody for you know surfing porn while they're on their computer uh, at work, then you have to you know, make sure you have the evidence for that before you take the HR action. Um, and so, um, uh, but nowadays, um, we can, uh, uh, the computing power and the ability of the operating systems nowadays allows us to track everything in real time. So um, I used to work for a company called uh, Carbon Black Bit9, uh, if you're familiar with it. Uh, Bit9 is a software that basically looked at every file, and, Bit and Carbon Black as well, uh, to every, every file uh, that's executable when it gets written, and then when you execute it, what all of the things it does. It, it does this thing in memory, it, it writes these other files, and, um, and, 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 you, and, and feeds all that information up to a centralized server. And so when you get to, to, to do your analysis, you basically you know, just pull that up and say, um, you know, here is the bad file, how did that bad file get there? And it you know, will build a, uh, a, a, a timeline. And this can be done you know, seconds or minutes after the thing just occurred. And so uh, you can build that timeline, snapshot it, call HR, and, 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 and move things forward. And, um, of course, it's also used for security. Uh, so a lot, a lot of the use cases are more, you know, find the, the, the Trojan or, or, or malware that they download. But, um, but that's the idea. I currently work with software, uh, as I told you at the beginning, I work for a company called Drawbridge Networks. And we basically take the concept of that and uh, take it to the network. And so what, we, uh, what our software does and, uh, is basically looks at every network transaction that, uh, that occurs and uh, logs all that in real time. Um, and, uh, and you can then you know, build a, a forensics case based off of that. So you can tie that data together. Um, and of course, we're integrated because you know, used to work for that other company. Now I work for this company. So it all works together. And, and you can do both a network forensics and a uh, you know, uh, process-based forensics and get a full timeline of how things occurred um, in real time. Um, there's also abilities to grab just the data you need from a system and so if you want to want to you know grab data and you can also grab things out of memory if you're doing it in real time uh, so uh, if, if there's certain there's certain really high-tech tools that uh, you can hide stuff only in memory you can create RAM drives and, and that stuff will go away when you turn the machine down and so um, uh, it does this does happen sometimes in, um, uh, in, in evidence cases uh, a lot more with if, you know, a mobile phone analysis uh, but the idea is is that if you can get a computer live still running you can do a lot more with it than you can uh, with something that's shut down and you're just looking at the data on the hard drive because you're forgetting all the stuff that goes on and it's, it's hard to build that timeline and, and, and find things that are hidden um, in memory uh, yep question Here, here we go. We got the. I think we got the mic working now. So, from a law enforcement perspective, if the law enforcement person is actively on the system, 
you know, they're making changes to it. It's no longer the old school where you have a preserved copy and that there's no evidence of uh, law enforcement tampering. You have the law enforcement person there doing things. How do you establish that the uh, evidence is clean? So, uh, so there's a lot of this. So we start off, and if you want to hand it, um, if we take a step back a, a, a decade and uh, look at what we were doing there, it was all on, on like firewall logs, and we were looking at what people were doing, and um, the, uh, the the logging subsystem of those basically makes it so that it's uh, uh, very easy to use from a technology perspective, but doesn't have a chain of evidence. Doesn't uh, it's not it's not non-refutable, um, and but that the process of how you obtain that information. Um, can be presented in a court of law. It just doesn't have that uh, uh, that firmness of that. But there was case law built on that, you know, on, on presenting firewall logs in uh, in the court case, and um, uh, don't have them in the top of my head. But that built the case law that allows us to continue to to build off of that. And so with the new technology, if you can, uh, you basically uh, some of the process is having a third party audit the. The the collection technology, and then uh, and then being able to present you know if it's open source then it's great because you can see the source and you can have a third party say there's nothing funky going on here and you just step through the process of how, how it works and yeah defense will come at you but th that's you can still present it in a court of law um, uh, because of uh, presenting logs back in the late 90s early 2000s okay question. All right, uh, why wouldn't you do your collection of your three and use a fem um, 5D MD5 hash? So if you actually have the machine, then you can turn around and you can verify what's been changed by bit count. The yeah, when you have on there. Yeah, when you have a whole desk image, yes. That, that, that's if you actually catch the actual machine. But at the same time, what a lot of people are forgetting, not all the information is just on that machine. If you have the router that it's going to, you can actually pull the data from that router. It's not just the machine that holds the information. Right. And you can trace it back. That's how a lot of people get caught in the back end. Right, yeah. Yeah, the, the all the networking information is, uh, um, and, and the reason that, uh, you know, plug my company again, is is that, uh, you know, by getting the data from the source, we is uh, ours is an agent-based solution, so we're getting all that network data collection uh, from the machine itself and, when the kernel tells you what it's doing, it's uh, a little bit more non-refutable, uh, but not completely. Um, and there was a question up front over here. Okay, so um, talking about the level of assurance, uh, or how much confidence we would have in a certain type of evidence, um, I just wanted to see if I can get your thoughts on some of the, the, the state-sponsored attacks um, you know, with the whole Sony thing that we had last year, mm -hmm. it, it seemed like the FBI came out within a week uh, and, and said, hey, this is, this is North Korea. And we know just from a technical standpoint how challenging attribution can be. So I wanted to see if I could get your opinion, maybe um, what level of skepticism do you think we should have uh, when we hear these things from uh, maybe the FBI or maybe the, um, the Secret Service or other government, uh, right, law, uh, law enforcement um, organization. Yeah, it's a, a great topic. Uh, a, a little off topic, but a great question. I'll, I'll answer quickly. Is that it, you should always meet it with a high level of skepticism. You're looking at the company that that made that claim. So it wasn't the FBI that told you know that figured this out. It was Mandiant, uh, and so Mandiant was uh, the the um, federal contractor that was doing the analysis. Um, uh, also, Bit9 and, and Carbon Black, we were there, um, you know, helping Sony uh, to be able to uh, to do some. Uh, uh, they hire several teams, and so you know, we weren't hired by the FBI; we were hired by uh, Sony. And so, so um, uh, attribution is hard. Um, and so, what they look at is 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 um, if they can get you know, once they get the the malware, you can break it apart and look at how a program is built. And if you already have samples from that group. That use the same, uh, you know, coding structure, same, you know, comments, uh, you know, reuse modules. I mean, th this is all, you know, malware nowadays is not uh, a kid in the basement coming up with a, you know, a, a hundred line uh, code that that you know does uh, you know, re reboot the the internet grid, right? You've got teams of of professional. Prof uh, um, 
programmers writing this stuff, and they're managed just like any other software team, and so they reuse software, uh, reuse modules in their software a lot. So that's one way of attribution. Other way is um, the infrastructure of a hack uh, often um, involves using intermediate servers that are already hacked, right? And so that I can move around and talk around and communicate. And if you're using the same infrastructure, that's also another attribution tactic. Uh, so, so that's the methods of attribution. It's not, you know, it's not hard science. And, and so everybody was surprised how quickly they came out and said it was North Korea. Um, and so, um, you know, and being in the security field, I also had the, my skepticism on mind, but uh, that's how you take that. All right, another question? Uh, to throw out a hypothetical, like I'm the CTO of a, of a major company. I don't know we've been hacked, but I want to know if we've been hacked is such a service available like I we have no idea if our data is compromised but we want an audit of that possibility is that there oh yeah so um, uh, and what form does it take uh, basically you're looking at uh, you're either looking for a security assessment um, or a pen test so pen test is short for penetration test and there are lots of companies out there that will uh, basically are hackers that you you hire you ever, remember the movie sneakers from back in the 80s i mean those companies exist in droves uh they're usually uh fairly small and compact and and you know a lot of local uh, companies that can come out and basically try to hack you and tell you where you're 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 um where you're vulnerable uh security assessments will take a more um, holistic approach and and kind of analyze the the data that you've uh, you know how you've structured your IT, and look for you know uh, kind of um, uh, you know th they're not going to necessarily try to hack the system, but they're going to see all right you're running this software and you're doing it this way, and that is you know not a very secure way of doing it, and therefore you know there's but but uh, finding footprints um, yes uh, those companies provide those services as well, and um, w when we talk about um, the uh, the point in which people realize that they're hacked uh, there's two interesting bits of data there um, and uh, one is time to real to know that you're hacked and it's currently in the months like nine ten months range average of all the you know so there's some that are like you know two or three years they've been owned for that long and didn't notice and then there's people that you know uh, have some newer software that allows them to to, to see those uh, attributes uh, sooner uh, so that's interesting and then the other aspect is um, um, oh come on I lost it so uh, yeah the length of it uh, oh and, and where you get where you find out a lot of times most companies get called by the FBI um, they'll get called by uh, Visa MasterCard and say that you, you're 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 owned or some other type of, you know, large. Sometimes, uh, you know, Microsoft has a big team that does it. Um, uh, uh, Google and Facebook have really good teams, but they don't necessarily, uh, you know, out there looking for, uh, uh, looking for everyone else. But that that's generally like when 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 they see evidence being published on the dark web, and it's got your domain names in it, you know, they'll call you up. And and so there, there's actually, I think it's like. 60 or 70 percent of companies uh, find out from a third party that they've been hacked um, and so uh, best way uh, is one yeah bring in hackers to look around uh, uh, and then they're going to recommend software uh, that uh, does more real-time analysis allows you to um, you know uh, see more and collect more because this change has only happened in the last you know five or six years uh, you know a lot of the security organizations don't uh, have the funding to buy all this new software and so um, uh, and when you get those recommendations you come by and buy uh, our product at drawbridge networks so. yeah actually I was gonna hit on that same topic if you don't actually have the data coming in with a tool that is uh, looking at your logs looking at everything that's happening across your network you're never going to have one of these folks be able to help you um, so you've got to start there uh, before you can even know you've got a problem. Yep. To go back over that, uh, something corporations need to pay attention now, as he stated, f within the five years it's changed. Uh, security is a big thing. You need to pay attention. 
um, it's kind of the field that I'm also in. I would say you want to use a UTM, a Unified Threat Manager, and there is a lot of them out there, as he stated. So a Unified Threat Manager will track information going out, going in, as long as you have somebody who's monitoring it. If you're not monitoring to it, it doesn't matter. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to skip this next one, next video here, and uh, talk about uh, Apple versus FBI. So, uh, so there's lots of aspects of this I can go into. We got only got about 20 minutes left, and I want to have some time to talk about anti forensics uh, and privacy stuff. Uh, and so I want to just gauge the interest in the room uh, about you know, going into this topic. Uh, it's it's related to forensics and, and so much that it, it was you know the FBI trying to get this, and, and it seemed like a very interesting topic to bring up. So. Uh, hands the room, you want me to go over this or, or you just come back to the uh, big session later? All right, so I think that's enough hands. Um, all right, so so leading up to the incident, we're going to set the stage, put the context around this. Uh, 2014, uh, Apple releases iOS 8. The security enhancement in there basically said that I, you know, when you get your phone, you put in your passcode or you know, it, it starts encrypting your, your device uh, with a key that Apple doesn't have, and the the, the key is it's stored on your machine on, on your on your uh, phone on your device, and the only way to unlock that key is to put in your passcode, and uh, so the only way to unencrypt your device, so your whole device is, is encrypted most of it. We'll get to that, is and so you have to put in a passcode. So that that's that's where we're at with the the technology. Um, I'll probably skip some of the other, uh, you know, the, the, the federal stuff um, about uh, the, the vulnerable equity equities process, but it, it goes to answer a question uh, uh, at the very end of this story. Uh, but basically, um, there is a there is a policy um, that the U.S. government has on if they find a vulnerability, how do they go about doing it? Do I do I give it to my my hacking team, my red team, my, uh, the, the guys in, in Army Cyber that are going to go out and use it as, as an offensive tool. Like there's a vulnerability that maybe we only know about, so maybe we use it to hack the, our uh, uh, adversaries. Or do I publish it or, or go contact the manufacturer of that software and let them know that they have a vulnerability? Um, and um, uh, it, but it's got a lot of history to it, but basically. Uh, Heartbleed was one of those that kind of brought this to the surface. Uh, it was a huge vulnerability, and there was a story that got put out that said um, NSA knew about Heartbleed and, and was hiding it. Uh, that's been proved false, um, but that at least made the NSA step up and actually respond, because NSA normally says, "I'm sorry, we're, we're not going to comment." You know, that that's we don't even exist, right? Uh, so so uh, they actually came out and, and actually talked about this process um, and then Obama kind of put some more language around it and became stronger um, and then uh, and then through a uh, Freedom of Information Act EFF obtained the actual um, uh, uh, VEP process uh, that's 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 been written out of course a lot of it you know, there's, there's some redactions in there uh, but uh, through the process I'm just put it up on the screen real quick you know basically there is a formal process so our government does care about this and uh, what's great is that the uh, the people that look at and make the decision on whether or not to use it offensively or defensively um, are part of are part of the defense side uh, of the NSA and so uh, that's a good thing that means that most of the vulnerabilities that they published uh, what's the 91 percent disclose disclose that's a, that's a the NSA came out and said that since this date we have disclosed 91 percent of the vulnerabilities that we found and so it's the government in general, um, and there's this great uh, reference uh, I get this data from where they go out and prove that this is probably correct. Uh, and and uh, all right, so just enough on that. And that's just to kind of answer this last question. So what happened is, uh, you know, a judge said, um, you know, uh, we need to get into this iPhone, and Apple, you're going to do it. And Apple says, well, I don't have the key, um, so I can't just unlock the phone. Um, and then there's other security measures in there. It says if you you know type in your password too many times, it's going to wipe the device. So I can't brute force. I can't sit there and try every combination. Um, and so um, the the vulnerability that exists is that um, if you can uh, uh, 
Uh, basically, it, it, your whole your whole system is encrypted, but it's your kind of your data. And so the software that runs iOS, uh, you know, that does the password stuff, obviously has to be unencrypted because you can't. You got to put in your code first to unencrypt it, right? So you got you got to be able to get to the lock. And so the lock itself, that software that does the lock, is uh, in clear text. And so if you were to be able to hook that phone up and convince it to do an update of that software, then you could get into that phone. So basically, uh, that's why you know that's why the the truth of the matter is is that the judge was basically saying, um, uh, we need you to write software to hack your own iOS, and and Apple stood stood the ground and they they told him no, um, and so um, eventually FBI got a third party company that says we'll do it, sure as a couple million dollars, but they got they came in and and uh, did what they asked. And 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 produce and basically unlock the phone from them. It's like, hey, give me the phone, you know. All right, here you go. It's unlocked. They so uh, so the, the question is, all right, so you got this vulnerability, right? It's going to go through the vet process, and that's as obviously. I mean, everybody knows. So you, you sh you're just going to tell Apple, right? The FBI goes, well, you know, they just did it for us, so we don't know the vulnerability, so therefore we can't disclose it. And it was just. Uh, I still am a little upset about that, uh, and because uh, you know the, the, it's, it's it's the process is there, and, and uh, um, so they they set up the situation just right, and so there was a, uh, they still in the end um, got the device unencrypted, and, and Apple stood its ground, which was great, uh, and stands a lot of precedence. Uh, so we got a question here. Yeah, although this would be a, a pain in the butt to do, would it be possible just to keep cloning the phone and then? Um, Brute force in the pin since it's just usually just a pin uh, password on them. Um, so um, cloning the process of phone is not as straightforward as with a hard drive. You only have that uh, you know the basically the, the the lightning connector ability to uh, you know connect to the device. And so uh, when you um, send a command over that you know. There's only certain things that are going to respond, especially if the phone is locked. Uh, you can still do iOS updates uh, through that or, or over the wire, um, and so you can still, you know, go in there and and, and convince it to update. Um, but you're not going to be able to, to clone the entire phone. And also, I heard uh, that with this particular one, the after you do after you get the wrong one enough times, the time difference between when you can try again increases. Right. Yes. So and so, so that's part of the... So, uh, still got a good bit of time here. So, anti forensics, this is the bad stuff, right? Um, as much as I, you know, I, I'm a huge supporter of privacy. Uh, you see my NSA shirt here, it's got lots of ironic quotes from, you know, Snowden and lots of people. So, it's, uh, I'm not here to support the NSA, other, uh, you know, other than um, that, you know, I do know people that work there and, and they all do great work but that the idea of uh, unlimited surveillance uh, you know I think that we do have a right to privacy and and so uh, and so because these tools exist um, I wanted to kind of introduce them to you um, and so just to kind of give you the full story about forensics is that you can uh, that people can do stuff to mess up forensics in, in a uh, in a case and and if you think about, you know, in a Atlanta PD, you know, one person running through and, and scanning all these drives, it's a very robotic process, uh, um, you know, and, and so if if a time, like the first, the first bullet I got there is, you know, if you, there's tools in there that will allow you to go in and to change the metadata about a file. You know, it says that it was created on January 1st, but, uh, you know, 19, you know 2016, but I can change it to say 1970. Or and you know, set them all at the same time, or uh, or just recreate uh, you know and, and the the time state stamps to say that it's never been accessed because uh, that's an attribute as well that, that it's never been read, um, and because uh, on the child porn side, 
uh, you have to knowingly download uh, child porn, uh, knowingly obtain and own. And so if it's just on your machine, that's a case for, uh, you know, and, and you can prove that you never saw the photos or the videos, that is a case for uh, defense. And uh, any of those that I presented uh, through um, the, uh, the Atlanta, uh, um, the defense, uh, defense council down here, they've all been, they dropped the cases. So, um, so, yeah, so, so timelines, you mess with timelines, that can uh, be one way of uh, messing up forensics. Um, and so scrubbing deleted files. So um, when you do a forensic analysis, you can find stuff on the hard drive that uh, you might not even be able to see in your normal operating, uh, when you're booting up your normal operating system. And, and so when you delete files, um, they basically they just kind of say, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to uh, forget that this file exists. And, and it still is there, but that, you know, it's got a little bit that says, nope, I've already deleted this file. And when you need space, uh, you can rewrite over that. Um, but, it, it, you know, there's no cleaning of that file. There's no real deletion. It just kind of gets marked as deleted. And so if you've got a hard drive bit for bit for copy, then you can re retrieve that deleted data. Um, and so uh, one way of, of messing that up is, of course, if you scrub deleted files. And there's software out there that will do that, uh, you know, secure trash bin, you know, you look for those type of tools and you can be able to, uh, every time you delete a file, they will scrub the contents of that file, um, it r write it with random characters a couple of times and that way the magnetic media uh, doesn't store that. Um, of course, you know, different stories of SSDs and, and what, you know, uh, the capabilities of, of getting that, uh, that, uh, that data off of SSDs um, is still evolving. Um, scrub the metadata. So the um, this is uh, this is a good note. If you send, uh, especially if you send files around, so everybody writes a, a Word document, a PowerPoint, and and they email it to people maybe outside their company. The amount of metadata in those in those files, uh, Microsoft's gotten a lot better about this, uh, but in in Microsoft Office, it's a surprising amount of stuff. Uh, you know, there's there's changes that have been made by previous parties. There's editors. There's names of people that uh, you know. If you're connected to Active Directory and you do Office 365, uh, their you know domain accounts will be in that metadata. Um, and so um, so anytime that you're you know dealing with files like that, um, and you want to keep that clean, um, at least in Office. You can actually uh, uh, do that from from the tool itself. You, you can Google on how to do that, but it's uh, it's pretty basic to kind of go and, and and remove the metadata. So anytime you're gonna email out a Word document, always go and uh, I bas I, if the newer version of Windows, you just hit the I think the home button, or the one that's right and left to the uh, to the left of file, and there's a button you know, right there on that screen that says. Uh, uh, you know, review or uh, analyze metadata, and you can clean that out. Um, uh, so, are you, if you're done with the hard drive, you're done with the machine, you're you're sending it back to corporate, uh, you're selling it, um, and if, you know, or you're just just doing whatever. Uh, there is a tool called DBAN, uh, Duke. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, d d that's right. Uh, it's boot, and boot and Nuke, is, uh, I just forgot the Ds. Uh, but basically it's old software that's been around forever, that's been updated over time, and allows you to securely remove the data from that drive. It does the same thing as scrubbing a file that we were talking about before, uh, but does it from uh, a, a whole drive perspective. And, um, um, and so that is, uh, it's just do that every time, uh, you know, if you're and, and, and that will make sure that none of your data um, uh, will move on. Now, caveat as to that is SSDs. Uh, is that your question about SSDs? Okay, let me get through this and, and I get your question. So SSDs um, is, is um, it's, it's actual, you know, memory, uh, physical memory. And so it's, it's, it's electrons in a certain place and, and, and uh, not magnetic. Um, and so um, what the drive manufacturers have done is allowed for a process of being able to um, talk directly to the drive and tell it to do a secure wipe. And what it does is basically runs, uh, uh, runs the hardware to, to reset all that memory so that it, it's, it's completely done. Um, there's still a lot of investigation going on into, is that really secure? 
Is there anything I can do about that? I've read you know, stories on, on both sides, so I'm not going to be uh, taking a side on that. Is that it still may be possible on, on SSDs to get the data after you've done a secure wipe through the, the firmware. So, okay. okay, as far as you were talking about the uh, disk wiping software, how effective is DD and just pointing slash dev slash uh, say null uh, to overwrite the hard drive? Um, is it, would that be just as effective? Yeah, I mean, so there's, there's, so DBAM, what it does is, is you can, you can wipe your drives with all zeros or all ones, mm -hmm. or you can do random characters, and then you can go and do multiple passes like that. And so, yes, uh, you can get that done with you know, DD and, and a lot of other tools. Okay. Uh, DBAM is just a, a boot CD or, or USB drive, and so you have boots and nukes it. Okay. You know, so, um, uh, so my time, we got about four, four more minutes here. Um, and uh, so encrypt your data, that's an obvious one, um, as uh, if, uh, many tools, unless you're you know, getting caught by the NSA, um, are, are secure enough to be able to you know, uh, hide data from. Uh, now. now the problem is with standard encryption, if, if they see an encrypted file, uh, the prosecution is going to just say, all right, we're subpoena the key. We need you to provide the key. I can do a whole other presentation on the legality of that, uh, but the bottom line is they can do it, and 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 that they can. Uh, okay, uh, and so so encryption alone is not going to get you out of everything, um, but that you know looking at you know uh, encrypted solutions uh, um, allows you to to give uh, you know some uh, anti forensic capabilities. Uh, and then last one is top on mobile, and we'll just finish up with call uh, or questions. So um, uh, mobile, if you get a phone and you're going to give it to somebody else, uh, you know you're taking a SIM card out, you're selling it, whatever, and you go and you reset, you know maybe you put your password in wrong and it resets it, or you go to the settings and you say restore factory settings. That does not delete your data at all. Now. Remember, Apple devices still, you know, will, it will re-encrypt with a new key once you set that up. And so it's harder to get off of, for, for all Android, and I'm sure Windows Phone as well, is that uh, you basically can then take a device that's just been reset, plug it in your computer, it'll mount, and you can see all the data there. It's not even deleted. It's still there. So, um, so there is a Google on different tools that allow you to actually secure wipe a phone. And uh, you know, and 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 it, that's 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 a, a big thing. Um, and Android does have encryption. You can do the same thing on Android that you the iPhone does by default. Is uh, but it's not turned on by default for most operating systems. Uh, so uh, all right, um, questions. Is there a specific tool that you've used in the past, like PhotoRec, that's the best for like just recovering photos, regardless of which type of partition it is? Um, no, I, 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 my, my experience is kind of uh, off and on, right? So I do con, you know, moonlighting and consulting on this, and so I'm on a list of, of expert witnesses, and so every now and you know, once a blue moon, I'll have somebody call me up, and I'll, I'll go and do this. And so I, I just go and look at what's the newest, best, you know, for, for finding, um, uh, you know, for recovering files off of uh, that have been previously deleted. Uh, it, it's, it's really not... There really hasn't been a lot that changes there, um, and and being able to recover that. Uh, there are newer technologies that where you can encrypt a drive and hide it in a, in unpartitioned space, and so some of the newer tools will then also detect that stuff as well. So, uh, <coughs> question in the back. Yeah. So um, I've heard it before. I'm not sure if it's like a wives' tale or anything, but on on hard drives, if you have a file and you erase it with zeros, ones, whatever, uh, one one pass that um, you, know, you can use like a scanning, micro scanning electron microscope to actually read the disk uh, platter itself and yes. reconstruct the ghosts of bits. Or with SSDs, you know, the, wear the wear leveling that, that occurs that, that will have you know, your file still intact on a part of the disk that's there. What I'm actually curious about is um, where in the course of the investigation would that occur? Like if I'm a high profile target and you suspect that I've even tried to securely delete my files. When would you go to the that actual like extreme effort 
to try to do that. Surely, it's you know. it's going to be a yeah a, a cost of the uh, of um, the prosecution, and so it'll be the prosecution's office on deciding whether or not they want to pay for those external services. So I you know I've worked for the prosecution. I've I've worked with uh, Atlanta PD Cyber. They will get backed up, and at the time you know this was. Uh, that you know, I would just get called to come in and, and help out in a few cases, and so that's just a budgetary question about the prosecution, uh, and uh, yeah, of course, high-profile cases and whatnot. So, um, alright, question up here. That mic's coming your way. Oh, do we run out of battery? Out of time? All right. Well, I uh, can you get with this question now? Yep. All right. Uh, this is kind of an off-topic, kind of sort of an off-topic, top off-topic question, but the nature of the forensics kind of might lead to an answer, and it's kind of a question for the whole room, I suppose. But um, I, it's an application question regarding Google Chrome. Um, I used to use Google Chrome a lot as my primary browser, and I've since switched to Firefox because while lo while looking through the um, Google Chrome's cache on my hard drive. I noticed a bunch of images and even some movie files that I could have swore I had never ever seen before and they were downloaded and I was and I'm under the impression that Google Chrome was sharing my cache with other other users because I've always heard around the internet that oh Google Google Chrome's a botnet don't use it etc cetera, etc cetera. but I never paid that much mind because it was like random users on Slashdot or whatever but seeing a bunch of images in the browser's cache that I could that it seemed to me I couldn't possibly have downloaded it, j it seemed to kind of sh throw some new light onto that. Uh, Probably what you're belief. seeing there is called pre-caching, and it's uh, where browsers try to, to make it appear that it's they're, they're so fast, is that they will start downloading stuff that y they think you might click on. And so uh, um, that's the only thing. Google, I've, I've worked with Google uh, a, a number of times over my career. Um, and and you know they're serious about security. Uh, is that uh, Mozilla Foundation as well? I mean, so you're not going to get wrong, w uh, go wrong with you know um, Firefox or, or, or Chrome. You can uh, so on the privacy list. You know one of the things I talk about is is you can go out and take a look at here's some secure settings. Uh, so the website I have there, privacytools.io, uh, they have on that for Firefox. Uh, they have uh, here's all the configuration settings that you might want to tweak to give yourself more privacy and so um, but yeah I, I I don't think that there's any anything more nefarious going on there other than, than pre-catch all right so we've run out of time and I appreciate you all coming and, and uh, listening to just me and uh, y'all have a good con